Let me see. Good morning. Um, hi. I just wondering if the microphone working. Uh, hello. If somebody can text me if this microphone is working or not. Timothy, good morning. <laughs> Uh, maybe it's not working. I think it's not working. Mm. I'll take it off. Oh, sounds good. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's working. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much because this, this is new phone. So good morning. Merry Christmas to everybody. Um, uh, Charlie's here, by the way. <laughs> Come. We yes. were, we were uh, streaming is a different room today. Uh, thank yes. you, Abigail. Thank you, thank you. Hi, everybody. Merry Christmas. Charlie is here. Is coming. 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 Okay. <laughs> coming. Okay. okay. Yes, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Whatever holiday you uh, all celebrate in this December. The pandemic is still with us, but today is not the day to talk about all those kinds of things. What I want to do, though, is what I promised for already two weeks, is to read a bit of this article, which is a transcription of a speech which Picasso gave. And... It's in 1922 that he did this, and I won't I won't read the whole thing. It's it's found in an old journal, and I don't know if we can see it here. Can we see that? Picasso speaks statement of the author. Should I show it again? Just make sure. Wait. Okay. Uh, all told, it's very, the talk article is, is very fascinating, but I will read just a bit of it. Here it is. Now, I, I can say, I can hardly understand the importance given to the word research in connection with modern painting. In my opinion, to search means nothing in painting. To find is the thing. Nobody's interested in following a man who, with his eyes fixed on the ground, spends his life looking for the pocketbook that fortune should put in his path. The one who finds something, no matter what it might be, even if his intention were not to search for it, at least arouses our curiosity, if not our admiration. Among the several sins that I have been accused of committing, none is more false than the one that I have as the principal object of my work, the spirit of research. When I paint my object is to show what I have found and not what I'm looking for. In art, intentions are not sufficient. And as we say in Spanish, although we translate this into English like the whole article, uh, love must be proved by facts and not by reasons. What one does is what counts and not what one had the intention of doing. We all know that art is not truth. Art is a lie that makes us realize truth, at least the truth that is given us to understand. This is a very wonderful little vignette of Picasso. 
The artist must know the manner whereby to convince others of the truthfulness of his lies. If he only shows in his work that he has searched and has researched for the way to put over his lies, he would never accomplish anything. The idea of research has often made painting go astray and made the artist lose himself in mental lucubrations. Perhaps this has been the principal fault of modern art. The spirit of research has poisoned those who have not fully understand all the positive and conclusive elements in modern art. And has made them attempt to paint the invisible and therefore the unpaintable. They speak of naturalism in opposition to modern painting. I would like to know if anyone has ever seen a natural work of art. Nature and art being two different things cannot be the same thing. Through art, we express our conception of what nature is not. Velasquez left us his idea of the people of his epoch. Undoubtedly, they were different from what he painted them. But we cannot conceive of Philip IV in any other way than the one Velasquez painted. Rubens also made a portrait of the same king, and in Rubens' portrait, he seems to be quite another person. We believe in the one painted by Velasquez, for he convinces us by his right of might. From the painters of the origins, the primitives, whose work is obviously different from nature, down to those artists like David, Indres, and even Bouguereau, believed in painting nature as it is. Art has always been art and not nature. And from the point of view of art, there are no concrete or abstract forms, but only forms which are more or less convincing lies. Those lies are necessary to our mental selves is beyond any doubt, as it is through them that we form our aesthetic point of view of life. Cubism is no different from any other school of painting. The same principles and the same elements here, sorry, are common to all. <laughs> uh, the fact that for a long time Cubism has not been understood and that even today there are people who cannot see anything in it means nothing. I do not read English. An English book is a blank book to me. This does not mean that the English language does not exist. And why should I blame anybody else but myself if I cannot understand what I know nothing about? I also often hear the word evolution. Repeatedly I am asked to explain how my painting evolved. To me, there is no past or future in art. If a work of art cannot live always in the present, it must not be considered at all. The art of the Greeks, of the Egyptians, of the great painters who lived in other times is not an art of the past. Perhaps it is more alive today than it ever was. Art does not evolve by itself. The ideas of people change, and with them, their mode of expression. When I hear people speak of the evolution of an artist, it seems to me that they are considering him standing between two mirrors that face each other and reproduce his image in infinite numbers of times, and that they contemplate the successive images of one mirror as his past and the images of the other mirror as his future, while his real image is taken as his present. They do not consider that they are all the same images in different planes. Variation does not mean evolution. Here we go, I just go. If an artist varies his mode of expression, this only means that he has changed his manner of thinking, and in changing, it might be for the better, or it might be for the worse. The several manners I have used in my art must not be considered as an evolution or as steps toward an unknown ideal of painting. All I have ever made was made for the present, and with the hope that
that it will always remain in the present. I have never taken into consideration the spirit of research. When I have found something to express, I have done it without thinking of the past or of the future. I do not believe I have used radically different elements in the different manners I have used in painting. If the subjects I have wanted to express have suggested different ways of expression, I have never hesitated to adopt them. I have never made trials nor experiments. Whenever I had something to say, I have said it in the manner in which I have felt it ought to be said. Different motives inevitably require different methods of expression. This does not imply either evolution or progress, but an adaptation of the idea one wants to express and the means to express that idea. Arts of transition do not exist. In the chronological history of art, there are periods which are more positive, more complete than others. That means that there are periods in which there are better artists than in others. If the history of art could be graphically represented, it, as in a chart used by a nurse to mark the changes of temperature of her patient, the same silhouettes of mountains would be shown, proving that in art there is no ascended progress. Many think that cubism is an art of transition, an experiment, which is to bring ulterior results. Those who think that way have not understood it. Cubism is not either a seed or a fetus, but an art dealing with primarily with forms. And when a form is realized, it is there to live its own life. A mineral substance having geometric formation is not made so for transitory purposes. It is to remain what it is. One second, sorry. One second. It's a digital way. And will always have its own form. <laughs> but if we are to apply the law of evolution and transformation to art, then we have to admit that all art is transitory. On the contrary, art does not enter into these philosophical absolutisms. If cubism is an art of transition, I am only sure that the thing that will come out of it is another form of cubism. give to form and color all their individual significance, as far as we can see it. In our subjects, we keep the joy of discovery, the pleasure of the unexpected. Our subject itself must be a source of interest. But what use is it to say what we do when everybody can see it if he wants to? We see the art. We experience it. We hear the music. And that said, I show this just to everyone. It's a little sketch of Stravinsky. And that reminds me That reminds me of the ending of what I, I think is a wonderful film about Stravinsky, a documentary taken back, I believe, in the 1950s, uh, where Stravinsky, the, the, I would say the camera pans towards Stravinsky's face, and Stravinsky says, I love music, but more than music, I love to compose. Thank you. With that, and now we will move to a little music. So the question is, what shall we play? Shall we play two pieces or one piece? 
Why you ask me always? <laughs> Maybe I'll ask the audience whoever is there. Should we, should we play one, two pieces, or one piece? Many pieces. Many. many. Not many. No, not. I don't. I don't want to play many pieces. It becomes much too boring. You do this first. Yes. Okay. Let's do this first, and then. I want a second, or I want to take this off. Try this new format and this new round just for today. And I hope uh, that it's working okay. That uh, this this was a very long journey for us <laughs> from the room over there <laughs> to the room here. <laughs> but in this very special time, that's. <laughs> Farther apart than it is close. Like this. Okay. And I'll try this, but I always put on my room incorrectly. Okay. This is here. This is here. I hope my clarinet works. I know that yours works very well. <laughs> Shall we? <laughs> oh, uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, I, I forgot to, to mention what we're actually playing. <laughs> Although it's going to be familiar to yeah, just about everyone knows, yeah. here. But this is Francis Poulenc's Sonata for Two Clarinets which I believe was the second piece which he wrote, or at least was published. Uh, she wrote it in 1918. It was both a year of, mm -hmm. in, in France of course, of, of uh, rejoice because this was the end of the First World War, but also the beginning of the terrible swine flu epidemic, pandemic, from which makes it very apropos to today. And yet, we see how Poulenc, in his, in his youth, didn't do research, but he imagined a great future.
And I think with this, I can say to all of you, happy holidays, be well, be safe still. Although some parts of the world are actually almost back to normal, other parts of the world are not at all. But you will all make it. And very soon we will see you in the new year. Be well, everyone. Take care.